Welcome everyone to the first edition of the live Mere Mortals book reviews. I have done some live ones before, but they've always been the monthly book recaps. There's gonna be a bit of a change to the channel. So welcome to everyone new who is just coming into this. War or Revenge, pick your poison is what Juan is telling me in the chat. And indeed, this is going to be a bit of a explanation or exploration of this book here, Primo Levi's If Not Now, When. Before I get into the, the full details, I'm recording here on the 9th of October, 2023. And yeah, these live book reviews, they're just a total different change up of style. I'm going to basically be doing a lot more subjective opinions of the book rather than the objective. You might be wondering, Karen, you've done so many and they've followed this strict style of the synop intro synopsis themes, personal, um, personal observations, takeaways, and then summary. I'm gonna switch it up a bit. I'm just really gonna feel this out and, and see what works experiments because I was just noticing people weren't really engaging, connecting with the content as much as I hoped I would. So at the moment, I'm gonna be going live on a Monday, 10 a.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time, which is UTC midnight on Sunday, uh, wherever you are in the world. So just take your plus or minus off um, from that. And yeah, that could be changing just depending on the future. We'll, we'll see how we go. So we'll, um, yeah, we'll leave it at that for the moment and just dive into uh, this, this book. So my initial impression, I was thinking that this was gonna be a real dark brooding book. Even just the name Primo Levi, there's something about, I mean, obviously it reminds me of Primo Ham, but <laughs> there was something just about this. And a lot of his book titles do have this kind of menacing quality to it. The, the truce, um, uh, uh, is this a man or if not a man or something like that, uh, if not now, when, or this is a man. And when I was starting to read it, I was like, okay, this isn't as dark as I, I thought because a little bit of a backstory of the author as well as he um, survived uh, through Auschwitz and was an, I believe an Italian Jew uh, who got rounded up. Eventually he, he survived just like sheer circumstances through luck. So I was expecting to be this, this to be like, oh, this is gonna be, you know, some pretty heavy dark stuff, which is what you see in a lot of war books, which are kind of like this, such as uh, one's favorite book, my, my co-host on, on, um, on this channel, his favorite book, uh, what's, what's the book name, Juan, you're in the chat. Um, I'm completely blanking on it. Um, Victor Frankl's book. <laughs> anyway, the, uh, the point of this was, I, I guess it was just, it was a bit more lighthearted and it was a bit more, uh, I, I suppose a, a story, a plot line, whereas I was expecting something which would be uh, really focusing on the subjective nature, man search for meaning. Thank you one. Um, which was, I was expecting something a bit more Mm, really investigating what it is to be a person, revenge, war, anger, things like this. Whereas those subjects were only briefly touched upon. I don't, I don't feel it was really in there. Um, I had heard of him through another book. Th so this isn't his most famous and uh, I was going to get some of his other ones, but this is the one I ended up reading first. So yeah, it was just, a, I suppose a, my initial impression was, eh, it was a, a little bit muted. So what's the book actually about? Uh, basically, it's uh, a fictional storytelling of uh, a man called Mendel and another man called Leonid. And they meet up in this this forest behind German lines and there's this bit of a standoff at first. They're, they're trying to feel each other out because basically they're both behind enemy lines. Uh, they're Jewish and uh, so they speak Yiddish um, to themselves, but obviously the, the, the book is written in English or at least I've got a translated version. I'm not actually even sure if this was... Um, yeah, translated from the Italian by William Weaver with an introduction by Mark Masover. So this was the modern classics Pen Penguin edition that I had. Uh, but in the book, they're all they're all speaking English, and uh, what we see is they they gradually just start having having to be on the move. When you're behind enemy lines, there's no certainty. You can not just exist in a stable location with a house or build a hut for yourself or anything because the Germans could come along at any time. The ban bandits could come along at any time. Peasants could have a, a um, justification like an uprising against you. They could come along. So it's always a very uh, precarious situation. And especially when you involve more people in, it's like, okay, is this person a good guy, a bad guy? Are they gonna hurt me? What are their motivations? 
So these two guys meet up and basically they just go in search of a, a band of other Jewish people who they can feel more comfortable, safe with, there's safety in numbers, that sort of thing. So they meet up with various kind of bands along their journey. They first join one where they're in this abandoned monastery and then they just get absolutely rooted by the Germans. They come in and uh, only five, ten of them escape. They're very lucky to escape. Then they meet up with this group of partisans and basically a partisan was someone who was behind enemy lines and would fight, I guess, for their country without being fighting for their country officially. So if you were in part of the Red Army, a Russian, and you were behind German enemy lines, I should have mentioned all of this is during World War Two. Uh, the the thing that you would do is like your instructions were to, you know, sabotage railway lines to meet up with other um, German, uh, Russians who are behind enemy lines and to uh, form a group and try and infiltrate. And then you could get, um, you know, radios and, and orders back from high command or something like this, or it, not even high command, like the lesser commands. And you're basically just to be a menace was, was your general plot and, and to just try and stay alive because you're in a very precarious situation where you you can't use you can't walk on roads for example because if the germans find you they're going to kill you or they'll put you in prison or something like that uh, if you're talking to the peasants or to farmers you know some of them might be sympathetic to the germans they could report you in and then next thing you know yeah bad things happen so you're always in this kind of state of suspense of trying to just move along and and feel out and you can kind of feel this atmosphere coming from the book where it's there's a lot of uncertainty everyone's just trying to feel their way through there's there's no guaranteed you're going to get food the next day there's no guarantee you're going to be alive in a week there's no guarantee that you'll ever see your family again if they still are alive because who knows they could have been killed and so uh, Mendel for example the I'd say the main character of this book and the one who we get the most insight into he is very, he's a thinking man rather than a doing person. You could say his nature is very sympathetic, empathetic. He's, he's not a fan of violence. He, uh, you know, he, he basically gets halfway through the book before he uh, has to kill anyone. And he, he's, he's just a, he's a tortured soul, I guess. And he's tortured because his whole family was basically put in a pit. I don't, I can't remember if he had to dig the pit himself. You know, it's, it's that kind of really, truly awful torture psychologically, physically as well. And, uh, yeah, so his, his wife in particular, I think her name's Rivki. She, um, she kind of plays up in his thoughts a lot. And what we see as the book progresses is this, you know, these bands, they, uh, they go from one place to the next, and then they, they form this cohesive group with the Gettalists, Gettalists, and uh, led by a man named Gelada, Gelada. I'm not going to pronounce these names very well. And uh, we can see that as he's, he's kind of finding some comfort, you know, he meets a girl, Line, and um, has uh, sexual intercourse with her, which then breaks Leonid's heart. And Leonid basically goes on a suicidal mission. You can sign, kind of see... There's all these various different characters. So it ends up being eight to 10, which are really talked about, you know, white royal key, black royal key, um, Pavel, Piotr, Mendel, Gelada, Line, um, Gelada's girlfriend, Be Bella. There's just a whole host of characters. So you, you're kind of trying to get your head around, okay, who's this one? Like, what are they doing? What's their motivation? Eventually, the the front line of the Russians passes by them. And so they're now in a slightly more safe territory, but they're all Jewish. And so even the, the Russians now are kind of a little bit iffy about the Jews. They're, they're not so sure of them. Uh, there's this kind of constant persecution that keeps going on. And eventually they, they find their way through Poland into Italy. And that's roughly where the book ends, where um, the, the very last thing that happens to them is they've uh, just gotten into this party where they're kind of being paraded as, uh, as like these survivors of, of all of this crazy stuff happening to these kind of rich Italians. And then, um, uh, who was it that gives birth? One of the, I think it's white real key. She, she gives birth right at the end, um, to Isidore's baby, another, another guy. So it's just a very, uh, it's, it's a book that's really fragmented, I'd say, because there's no, 
the the plot line the the structure of it it didn't really feel like it flowed tremendously uh the way it's set out is the the chapters are set out by date and so we have uh, how many in here there's probably like 10 ish chapters in total and they go from july 1943 july to august 1943 august to no no november 1943 all the way up into the end here of july uh, august 1945 is the the last kind of entry into this so we it, it's kind of capturing them in these little month periods time by time over the course of roughly two years so I'll, I'll jump i suppose into some of the questions themes that arise from this book one of the things that mendel shows is he's he's very tortured by obviously what's happened to him and what's happening to the jewish people but he's very much of the wanting to let it go he, he's he's mentally is just draining it's exhausting him he, he can't keep going on and you can see him trying to somewhat forget so jumping on a page 143 here uh, he's talking with Gelada and um, basically uh, this, this is what happens um, Gelada said uh, to the story and said to him you're not play acting you remain to watch Mendo and you haven't dressed in peacock feathers or a hawks either welcome to you Two, you'll be useful to us because you're prudent. You'll serve as a counterweight. With us here, prudence has been somewhat forgotten. We have a poor memory, except for one thing. What's that, Mendel asked. Galadab solemnly put his forefinger beside his nose. Remember what Al Amalek did to, you, uh, did to you on the way after you had come out of Egypt. And so he's relating a story here about the uh, you know, Jewish culture, old, old stories that peppered throughout this. He attacked you while you were on the road. He killed all the weak, the sick, the weary, and who were, who were straggling behind. He has no fear of God. And so when your God grants you peace from your enemies, you will extinguish even the memory of Amalek. Don't forget it. Yes, this is what we don't forget. I quoted from memory, but not irrelevantly this time. So he was really trying to forget. He basically had these tortured memories of, you know, his wife being put in a kit, uh, in a pit and killed, everyone in his small home village also dying and he, you know, just because I think he was a working man somewhat escapes. And yet other people don't want him to forget. Uh, the kind of constant memories of this are just being battered at him throughout the book every time he wakes up with a gun beside him um, there's only these small moments of respite when he sleeps with a woman for example but then immediately afterwards he starts comparing her to his previous wife who is now dead and is still haunting his memories and you get this feeling like he, he's he's never going to be able to get past it even though he really wants to whereas most of the other people in the band they are, they're out for a revenge they are angry they are absolutely you know kind of furious and the more they learn about what has happened in poland with the with the camps auschwitz for example or they call them the lagers what's happening in these lagers they they get incensed and infuriated by and even when there's this one particular moment where they're they're, they're kind of in the it's not peacetime yet the the russian armies move through so they're they're in a safe zone but they're still very wary because people are still wanting to um put jews behind bars they they keep getting these constant threats of molotov cocktails being thrown in by uh, russian nazis and there's this just constant um wariness and rightfully so because at one section they go into this town to just get some food and the, they did like a little scouting party and one of the the women in the group gets shot from behind and um the the group disperses and they're, they're like they, they take her back and, and she dies very shortly afterwards and so uh what does this group this band do of you know roughly 30 people of of jewish people they go into this town and they just massacre the the leadership of it they break into the the rat house the town hall so this is actually in german territory that the russians have taken over and yeah they just kill you know kind of 10 to 1 and you know everybody has hurt everybody and so jumping on a page 236 here the we, we see like is it right for others to uh, deserve this revenge and um you know mendel has experienced all of these terrible things what what does he think about actually trying to to get revenge and so uh he, he comes to this here uh they've paid aren't uh, so 
and Edict 2 is pushed, and now they are dying like us, with us. They've paid. Aren't you pleased? No, I'm not pleased. The debt hasn't been reduced. It's grown. Nobody will ever be able to pay it now. I wish that nobody would die anymore. Not even the Germans. I don't know. I'll think about it afterwards when it's all over. Maybe killing Germans is like when a surgeon performs an operation. Cutting off an arm is horrible, but it has to be done, and it is done. Let the war end. Lord and who whom I don't believe. If you exist, make the war end. Quickly and everywhere. Hitler is already defeated. These dead are no use to anybody anymore and we can kind of see a, a reinforcement of this when they go back they, they kill all these um as revenge kill all of these germans who, who killed their one woman in in like the, the peacetime and he's saying like you know this is just going to keep perpetuating the the more violence there is the more revenge it's not like it just ends it's it's not like you know you kill one of us we kill 10 of you that's that's you know done and dusted everything's going to be all right no those germans are going to remember those germans who they all kill well their whole family that's going to affect a hundred people and they're going to remember that and hold this burden against the jewish people and so you know who, who's right in all of this because some of them make the claim you know if this is wrong why does it feel why do i feel so good after you know massacring these these um these people who killed one of my friends first unprovoked you know and so it's it, it brings up some questions, I suppose, of who is who is right in war. In Mendel's case, he doesn't believe anybody is. He thinks everybody's kind of in the wrong when it comes to violence. This is more of my personal opinion as well. Uh, when it comes to revenge, it is very much you know cutting off your nose to spite your face. You you might feel good against this this awful nose of yours, but uh, in the end, it's not going to uh, serve you in your other purposes in life. And he just wants to forget, but other people want him to remember. They, they're trying to forcing, forcing him to remember, this is what happened to you. And uh, I'm, I'm more of the personal opinion that if anyone wants to forget, they, they, could, they should be able to forget and forgive as well. If no matter what has happened to you, it's, it's your burden. You get to choose how you react to it. And even if it seems strange, even if it seems strange of, you know, the, the man who murders and rapes and murders your, your baby child. There's, you know, court cases of, of people forgiving that person or who have accidentally killed someone and things like this. Uh, I think it's very much, you, you, sh you shouldn't be able to tell other people what they should feel they, and, and what they should do. If they want to forget, forgive, um, that, that's fine. If they want revenge and want to kill someone else, that's where I personally am, am more of the drawing the line of, of violence is essentially bad in almost all cases. So yeah, it's um it's a tough book to to read on that, and I definitely more am inclined to the Mendel uh, point of view. And, um, and yeah, just just watching him go through the book and see it's not easy to have that point of view because other people will try and force that upon you. So um, just a, a little learning from there. Jumping on, I guess, to the author and just some extra details related to this. Uh, he himself, it kind of felt like this might have been a book that he was writing of, of how he wanted to behave. Um, because <laughs> unfortunately for him, uh, Primo Levi was a rather lousy partisan. So he was in Italy for most of the war. Italy was actually a rather good place compared to the Eastern European states, Poland, Russia, Germany, um, that uh, that you know, Italy had Mussolini. It was, it's not like it was a, a walk in the park, but he was able to somewhat get work. Um, Jews were somewhat be able to to be sheltered by Italians and it wasn't, they didn't have the reprisals, the huge camps. There was a lot of fascism, obviously, but it wasn't as intense as, as you know, Germany and Poland, for example. And uh, he mostly existed through throughout the war. He did become a partisan for a very short time in the Italian mountains, but <laughs> he got captured almost instantly. So, uh, it, you know, you, you can maybe uh, question and ponder, you know, is this the kind of book that he wanted to be? Did he want to be like Mendel and these other fighting Jewish people who evaded the Germans, who got revenge, who, you know, got to feel these different things and, and to... Uh, make these decisions and were autonomous. Whereas for him, you know, he got captured, put in the camp, and it was, you know, kind of by sheer luck that he got, uh, he was kind enough. He, you know, he had, he was a chemist, so he got work. There was work for him, so uh, he wasn't just put out, you know, digging trenches and stuff in the bit of freezing cold where basically everyone dies. 
he got sick just before the camp was liberated um, and, and the Germans relocated them on a death march. And so he was too sick to do the death march. And so he got left behind and then subsequently he got saved. So yeah, he was, um, it was definitely one of those ones where it was like, maybe he, he wanted to be like this, but he, he couldn't himself. Um, and, but he did draw details from other people, other people that he was with were proper partisans in, in the camp in Auschwitz. So he got to hear their stories. And I think this was kind of an accumulation of those stories that he was trying to, to retell and, and pass on to others, hence the, the fiction and, um, and what he got to showcase there. Um, overall, my summary, I'm not going to give it a great review, uh, probably about a six out of 10 for, for if not now, when it, kind of just was lacking i think in terms of actual the storyline the style the weaving of characters in and out it it just did feel that bit fragmented it felt like someone who hadn't who wasn't a writer he was a chemist <laughs> and so he did write books and i believe his other books were more memoirs which I, i've heard are, are a lot more powerful compared to this because writing is you know you, you have to be a good a good writer has usually written a lot of books. You can see this was someone like George Elwell, my favorite author. His his first books are relatively rubbish. They're, <laughs> they're not they're not great. Coming up for air, uh, keep the apodistra flying, things like that. He's not a great writer. It's not until the end of his life, his last books like Animal Farm in 1984, where you get the full holy shit. Okay, this guy has honed his craft. So I on on that. I can't particularly recommend the book to anyone. Maybe if you want to get a feel for what it was like to be behind the the German lines as a partisan, as as a Jewish person, um, I haven't even touched upon, I guess, like the conflicts that this still comes from this. You know, th the stuff that is in this book is still occurring to this day. Uh, as we speak, I think a day or two ago, there was a Palestinian attack on Israel. And what's going to come from that? Is there going to be a reprisal from the Jewish people against the Palestinians? Are they going to, you know, for every one of theirs that are dead, kill 10 of them? Is that going to solve things? No, no, not particularly. And it's, um, uh, war is like, look, all you can take from this book is that war is, is truly awful. Uh, violence is truly awful coercion. And that if, if, uh, humans are kind of what, what you see in this is that the, the worst parts of us are truly, truly awful and they're the, the easiest to fall into. It's, it's, it's the harder portion to forgive. And if you can't forgive, just to forget and to not seek out that revenge um, and, to, and to indulge in that momentary thing that makes you feel better, but afterwards uh, it causes more pain and suffering than, than you can imagine. So I can't particularly recommend the book. If you, if I had to describe it, it's maybe something like storm of steel mixed with all quiet on the Western front, the, the storm of steel, like adventure, the, the capturing of moving from place to place, the bitterness and loneliness that comes from all quiet on the Western front, but just both of those imagine merging those two books and then having something, which is a fragmented crappier version of both of them. That, that's that's kind of like this. So, uh, yeah, overall, if not now, when by Primo Levi, I'm, I'm not the, the biggest, uh, the fan of that in, in general. And yeah, we'll, we'll leave it there for today. I have completely forgotten to do all of my switching that I was meant to do. <laughs> I'm showing, casing all the different images that I was going to bring up in these points. So, uh, that's okay. We'll, um, we'll leave that and I'll try and remember that for, for the next time. This is going to be a, a different section. One of the reasons why I have done this live is because one, it's a, a little bit easier and I, uh, not as much time intensive, but uh, I also wanted to, to thank the people who are helping to support this channel and being able to do it in a week by week basis. So I've talked a, a fair bit before about uh, support and boostergrams. And so this will kind of be like the boostergram lounge sec section. And then if I, if people are leaving any, uh, nice comments and things like that. I was, uh, I was, uh, I'll, I'll read them out as, as well on the YouTube and things like that. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, I was, uh, just going to thank a couple of people here. And so, uh, what we saw from last month, um, I think it was just after I, I put out the actual, uh, 
book review of um, of tr trauma and healing. The body keeps the score by Bessel van der Kolk. We've got uh, 5,492 sats here from Cole McCormick. Cole, thank you so much, mate. He says, my mother is training to be a licensed therapist. She told me about EMDR years ago and it sounded weird and not real. She will be learning how to administer ED EMDR in the coming months. So boots on the ground report is that make is in the making. Rapid eye movement opens up the nervous system like many other therapies, but there's no money in it. We have such little understanding of our brains and bodies. Yeah, that's that's probably true of of the things that did come up. I, I can kind of understand EMDR that sounded like there was a, a bit of research and um, verification science behind it actually working. The other ones which were more play acting on a stage or creating people to um, act out your, your trauma, uh, it just sounded very uh, intensive. It sounded it sounded like a you know good good remedies and things like this you'd, you'd hope would be translatable to be able to affect the mass market. So it's not just you know one person able to you know if it if it takes a hundred hours of a therapist to to really heal one person everyone is going to end up needing to be therapists because there's so many like damaged people out there that that everyone would become a therapist essentially to, to try and fix and heal the world. So you want those ones which are more easier and shorter and are able to be able to apply it quickly, which unfortunately, you know, with trauma and things like this, it, it doesn't actually work that way. So uh, yeah, I, ho I hope that um, works well, and um, yeah, I'm really interested to to hear how that goes. For I'll um, make sure to to catch up with you on um, America Plus and um, find out exactly what you're you're trying, uh, what she's experiencing with that. So, uh, thank you for that call. I also see Ashley Glenday here was uh, streaming in some amounts. Thank you, Ashley. Your contributions are not missed and uh, very much appreciated. For everyone who wants to know what this is, so if you're listening via or watching via the YouTube. Basically, this is a way where you can help support the show uh, via micro payments or larger payments of Bitcoin. And you can do this on the Lightning Network. You can do this through podcasting apps, which is what this uh, Cole and Ashley have been doing here. And uh, yeah, it's just a way of supporting the show directly. So as I as you're watching, reading, listening to to this you're contributing whatever value you find from these and um, i'm going to try and improve them i kind of stuffed up <laughs> the uh the uh the youtube version of this where i was going to show the different pictures and the chapters and things like that but that's okay it was my first time again so we'll I'll, i certainly will get better at that again and yeah, uh, to do that, um, just go to merementalspodcast.com slash support for the moment and um, you can find out how to help support the channel. And also, if you want an easier version, there's the, the PayPal, which you can send in any amount that you want as well. No one has ever done that. So if you do that, you will be the first and I will remember your name, much like I remember Chad F for being the, the first um, booster grammar to, to send in something to the mere model. So that will be very, very much appreciated. So the final section here, value for value, this is how everything is run. You're never going to notice ads on my channel. You're never going to notice um, sponsorships or things like that. No, I only want to do this directly through your support here at, at home. And uh, the way we do that is through value for value. So I'm going to keep creating these audio, these videos and putting them up for your enjoyment. And all I ask is that you just return in value in, in some shape or form back to me. You can do that by sharing the show with someone. You can do that by creating a clip, which um, is, is definitely doable uh, wherever you're listening or watching. Uh, if you have any recommendations, if you think there's something I missed from this book, if you have any other war books that you think would be great, you know, what is your favorite war book of all time? Please leave a, a comment or a message and um, I would definitely love to, to know that. And then finally, you, as I mentioned, you can uh, return some value via the, the PayPal or via streaming or boosting in a podcasting 2.0 app. So we're going to leave it there for today. Thank you everyone for joining me to the end of this book review. I'm going to be doing live every week from now on. And then one will be doing some bonus episodes just here and there. Uh, that, that'll also be thrown into the mix. I'm going to try and make this better. I'm going to uh, yeah, practice more. It's uh, it is kind of nerve wracking. You did see me uh, screwing up the 
Viktor Frankl's book, Man's Search for Meaning. I know that book, like I've, I've said that a billion times before, but there is something about getting in front of a, a camera and doing it live where it uh, puts a bit more pressure on you. So got to ease my way into that as well and set up all of the other things. Um, yeah, so we'll, we'll just leave it there for the moment. And um, yeah, really do thank you for joining into this uh, live episode and ciao for now until the next time.